and jump in. All right, so again, welcome this evening. We're gonna be talking about bees. Bees are a really unique group amongst all insects. They can cover a lot of different territories and they share a lot of different things with other members of their order. And we're gonna go into some of these other members of the, the, this classification of animals because I wanna take a good swath out of this subject to give you guys some context. So let's take a little bit of a look at that right now. So I'm gonna throw some science words at you. I know you guys love them. Um, entomologists, we entomologists love to classify things and you've heard me say this before in other programs. And in this case, we typically classify insects by traits they all share within a given group. In this case, bees and their relatives belong to an order of insects known as Hymenoptera, which means membranous wing. And this group contains all bees, wasps, ants, and um, it is connected to sawflies. Sawflies are kind of attached onto Hymenoptera as kind of an accessory group. Um, one of the biggest traits that we find in Hymenoptera is the common development of social behavior and relationships among members of different populations. And you'll most readily recognize this in honeybees. That's the one we all typically think of. They all have hive structure, they use casts, and I will go into that a little more later. Um, another trait that is shared among several members of this group, and the one that we all kind of dread, is their ability to sting. Um, many of these insects do have a stinging organ that is capable of delivering venom to their targets. Uh, not all of them sting. Some of them who can sting will do so only very rarely, and some of them will only use their stinger when it comes to getting their own food, like the case of the cicada killer. Um, and again, if you guys have questions about these different insects I mentioned, I know this one can generate quite a few. Please go ahead and ask them. Put them in the chat or we can talk about them when we're done. One thing that I would also add to this stinging organ discussion here is that some members of this group have actually developed specific cast members whose only job is to act as a defensive unit for their colony, hive, or nest. Um, sometimes that can be so radically changed that they're, those members aren't capable of actually consuming food themselves because their defensive structure is taking over so much of their own body. And that is generally just in the case of ants, I should say. So let's take a close look at our bee friend here. This is a picture I've shown you guys before if you've been to any of my other programs. And I love this picture. I wish I knew who took it because it really highlights the pollen basket on the insect. It shows you uh, them doing exactly what they always do, which is go collect pollen and collect nectar from flowers. And it just makes a great illustration. So a little bit about bees. Bees, amongst all of the insects in this group, have some of the most well-established social behaviors, only being surpassed by ants. Uh, many species will have developed at least rudimentary social behavior with a, like a queen though several members of the bee group can be solitary. Now, a lot of bees have also developed specific organs for carrying pollen, and our previous image kind of showed that. Uh, the honeybee has developed pollen baskets on the last set of legs on its body. And of course, in our livestock species, namely our European honeybee, we have honey production, which is a major part of industry especially here in Indiana. Um, there are very few counties you go to that don't have an active beekeeping organization. And of course, we're all familiar with the dreaded sting of a bee if we accidentally come into contact with them in a way that they think is dangerous. Um, I have members of my own immediate family who do have the allergy to bee venom. They have to have an EpiPen, and I'm sure a lot of you have a similar experience or story that you could tell. But what about some of the other members of the group of Hymenoptera? Well, I'm showing you one that we all kind of dread. Uh, this is a great picture of several yellow jacket species, and they belong to the group known as wasps. Wasps, unfortunately, we don't love a whole lot. Um, they do have some social behavior amongst some species, though it definitely is not nearly as prevalent in our bees as it is in our bees and ants. Wasps can be predatory or they can be herbivorous. So for example, if you've ever seen an absolutely massive wasp buzzing by, 
that you may have heard is referred to as a cicada killer. Cicada killers are predators specifically for cicadas. Now we don't have any out now because there aren't many predators of our 17 year cicada, not a brood X. However, our annual cicadas, which we will see later on in the summer as we get a little bit closer um, to fall, we will begin to hear our annual cicadas and that's when we'll see our cicada killers uh, preying on their preferred prey. Herbivorous wasps, we find plenty of those in orchards and on plants. Some of them can be pollinators um, and they'll just want the pollen and nectar, whereas other ones will actually go for fruit as well. Um, in Clay County, I've been to several properties where uh, orchard owners were trying to fight off a wasp infestation because they would be growing plums and, well, some of the yellow jackets will go right after the plums just as much as they will anything else. Now, one of the big reasons why we don't love our wasp is because they are fairly territorial. Um, yellow jackets are not very discriminatory. If you mess with a yellow jacket, you're messing with the yellow jacket and its entire family and they will come after you. Wasps also contain members that are known as hornets. Um, European hornets are one of the most common ones here in Indiana. And last year, we got to hear all about the Japanese hornet that was discussed in the news. Unfortunately, wasps will perceive this as intruders fairly quickly, especially around food sources. One thing that I will say about wasps that I find particularly um, salient in my own experience was I was working on a car one day and I was changing out the coolant in the vehicle. Now coolant, if you've ever been around a car that has a coolant leak, it smells kind of like syrup. It smells very, very sweet. Well, wasps will not be able to tell the difference between that and nectar. And as soon as that a nearby paper wasp smelled it, it decided to attack me and stung me twice because it thought the antifreeze was food and it wanted to keep me away from it. So there's a story for you. All right, so moving on to something that's a mildly less unpleasant, though it depends on your opinion and your experience with ants. Ants are another member of this group. What I'm showing you right now is a reproductive ant. This is a queen to be. She is looking for a nest and probably waiting for a drone to come by so they can mate and then find a place to create an ant nest. Queens and drones of ant species are winged. They will fly. However, once the queen is mated and she finds a nesting site, she will lose her wings and will no longer fly. Ants are kind of our extremists of this group. They have the extreme end of social behavior. They have incredibly uh, complex caste structures, depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there are some ants who are solely devoted to the defense of their nest or colony to the point that they've evolved very specific organs. Um, one example would be a species in Africa that's evolved an organ known as a nasuti. And what this does is it basically allows the ant to spray an acid out of its head. And it actually lacks mouth parts. It can't eat. They just live long enough to do their job. And that's really it. Um, and of course, you've seen large soldier ants as a part of colonies with the very large mandibles. Those ants can't actually feed themselves. They get fed by their sisters, um, the worker ants. So that's how extreme their development has gotten. Ants are extremely adept at colonizing news areas. They will form a permanent nest and then they will start to form satellite nests, which is why we find them in our homes like they started to do so a few weeks ago. Um, I myself fought off our own ant infestation and I'm very happy to say we did win, though some years that can be hit or miss. Um, ants are not capable of stinging. They do not have a stinger. Um, however, I did mention uh, different defensive organs that they've developed in specific body forms within their nests. Um, if you ever hear about a cow killer ant, or uh, it's a part of a family known as mutility, um, or they're sometimes called velvet ants as well. These are actually not ants. They are a wingless wasp, and they actually do have winged forms. It's just, I believe that is differentiated by sex. So, and they do have a stinger, and if they sting you, you will not forget it. I would definitely advise never handling a velvet ant or a cow killer if you ever find one. Generally, they're found more towards the more southern areas in the southwest, though. It's very rare we see them here in Indiana. Um, this is a really unique group that I wanted to make sure I mentioned. These are our sawflies, and you may wonder, you know, why are these important at all? Well, 
one thing that I want you to do is take a close look at this picture and realize that it is very, very zoomed in. Sawflies are generally very, very small, and they're just going to be that nondescript little black bug you see flying around. They're incapable of stinging. They do not have a stinger. Um, they're named a sawfly because their ovipositor, which is the organ they use to lay eggs, is actually kind of saw-like. So it cuts into, namely, a plant to be able to lay its egg. But it won't be cutting into humans anytime soon. Now, part of the reason I wanted to bring this up is because we often confuse them. Their larvae resemble caterpillars very heavily. So uh, they will consume plant material. They will look just like a caterpillar. And you may think that you have like a cabbage looper or something like that. However, these are very different from caterpillars in a lot of ways. Sawflies are our primary source of the rose slug sawfly, which is really why I wanted to mention this one, especially for you rose growers out there. If you see window painting on the surface of leaves on a rose, that's being done by a rose slug sawfly. And for those of you who don't know, window painting is where the leaf tissue has been worn or chewed away to the point that you can actually look through it, but it's still there. There's still one layer of leaf tissue left. And in our next picture here, I wanted to show you a close-up of the larva of the sawfly. If you look at this, this looks a lot like a caterpillar. But the difference between a caterpillar and a sawfly are the pro legs, these little fleshy legs that they have towards the end of their body. Generally, caterpillars only have like six of them towards the end of their abdomen, whereas a sawfly will have one on almost every single seg segment. So that's a major difference. You can also normally look at species of plants that they're eating, like say, for example, roses makes a great one. Most of the damage I see done to roses, if it's not done by a Japanese beetle, it's probably been done by a sawfly. All right, so let's dig in a little bit into what bees eat. So this is one that you guys are probably fairly familiar with already, but I wanted to at least highlight it a little bit. So we know that bees consume a lot of resources that come from plants. And what they do is they're consuming nectar and pollen specifically. Bees generally aren't herbivorous. You're not going to find a bee out there who's just going to be chewing away at leaves. They want protein from the pollen and sugar from the nectar. And they have evolved mouth parts that are very specific to that task. Now I say this, but I also want to make sure that you're aware that there is a small subset of bees out there that are actually, um, they consume carrion, and there is some evidence that indicates that they might actually be predators. And I believe I've got a picture of that. Yep, right here. This is called a vulture bee. Um, this is not an herbivorous bee. It does not consume pollen or nectar. It is a carrion eater. And um, there is, like I said, some evidence, a recent study showed that they may actually go after live prey. Now, you will probably never see this bee, but I like to point this out because it really highlights that there are exceptions to what we typically believe with most animals. And as an entomologist, I can tell you this is very, very true for insects. So let's go a little bit more into what our more common bees like to eat. So what I'm showing you here is a diagram of the mouth parts of a bee. And what's happening here is this is actually exerted from their head capsule. And there is actually kind of a an armed joint underneath this that will push it in and out. So that way the bee can get its mouth parts out. And it can actually use those two darker looking organs labeled as the gallia to be able to gather material. Say for example, if they're gathering pollen and then they can close them around the palps and the glossa that's labeled on here to be able to drink up honey. So they've kind of got this great multi-purpose mouth part. Um, sometimes entomologists will refer to them as chewing, lapping mouth parts. Um, sometimes I wonder if it's a if it's a bit of a misnomer, but you know maybe some an entomologist wiser than I can answer that question. So what are they going after more specifically? Well, they are going after more, namely pollen. Pollen is going to be the primary source of protein for bees and many other kinds of insects. There are a ton of different amino acids that they can get from pollen, but this is going to be very, very strongly based on the species of plant. So not all plants are giving an equal amount of different amino acids. However, pollen does always provide water, 
crude protein and other structural components that are going to be a part of bee health to be able to keep building their bodies, keep their organs functioning, et cetera. And of course, I mentioned the variation in amino acids that you're gonna get by plant. Now, the good thing is normally bees know what they're doing. They know which plants to go to. They know which ones are gonna provide them plenty of food. Um, so we don't probably need to worry about that too much. We just need to make sure that the plants are available to them so they can get their pollen. The other thing that a bee is going to go for is nectar. So I put this image, I love this picture because of a cute little bee butt in the air. But what they are doing is they are trying to get nectar out of the nectar reservoir in this flower. Now there's not a whole lot to say about nectar, but it is an incredibly vital portion of its diet. So one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that foraging behavior in bees and really any insect is extremely energy intensive. Imagine going for, oops, I skipped a slide there. Imagine going at a dead sprint constantly because you need to eat. Well, moving at that speed requires its own source of energy. So nectar is providing that and flight is particularly energy intensive. So that nectar will provide them a ton of sugars that they can burn to be able to fly and make it back to their nest to feed their young or what have you. So of course, while we're talking about what do bees eat, they first need to be able to locate their food. Now, for those of you who are at my Planting for Pollinators program a few weeks ago, you probably saw this one, this particular image here. This kind of illustrates how insects see. Insects in general have really poor eyesight. Um, they have exoskeleton that covers their eyes that'll get dented, dinged, and scratched. So it makes it so it's very hard to see. And their organs are really best for per perceiving movement in light and dark, though many insects have developed the ability to detect ultraviolet colors. Uh, bees in particular have this gift. Bees also tend to have somewhat better eyesight than a lot of other insect species because, well, flowers exist. This is an example of what a flower is doing for bee or other pollinators. In one image, you're looking at a flower the way that we see it, and the other one is an image that was taken using an ultraviolet camera or an ultraviolet filter on a camera. And it's been colored in to kind of give us a frame of reference since as humans, we don't know what ultraviolet looks like. In this case, you could see that the flower with its ultraviolet colors is kind of indicating to the insect, hey, land here amidst all the other junk in the background that their eyes just won't be able to differentiate very easily. Now, there are a few other ways that bees improve their chances of finding food. Now, this way primarily happens with honeybees, though ants also have some unique ways of communicating. Honeybees have developed a set of movements that's colloquially, colloquially refute, referred to as the bee dance. And this is a set of movements that communicates direction, distance, and quality of forage that they've managed to find. We've also, as entomologists, figured out that bees will also do their dance when they need to signal to their sister workers that there's like additional labor that's needed to be able to process food for and create honey. Um, this bee dance is so clear in its communication that entomologists have actually been able to decipher all of the movements to figure out what exactly a bee is saying. And given that this is an insect whose brain barely fills the head of a pin, I think that's just incredible that um, evolution has allowed that to happen. All right, so let's talk about some individual species here. Um, we're going to cover all the species I'm going to be going over now are going to be our native bees and our European honeybee. Uh, but I am happy to address questions on some of the other ones once we reach the end. So let's talk about our European honeybees. These guys are our most popular and our most, uh, honestly, economic benefits. This is an introduced species, so they do not actually belong here. Um, European honeybees were intentionally brought to the United States. Like the name says, they are from Europe. They were originally bred there. They are a major component of food production in our state and in several states because not only do they function as livestock in that they produce a food item, but they also assist in the pollination of other food items. 
Um, every year, beekeepers will ship their bees across the country to places like California where they will help pollinate crops. So they are absolutely vital to a significant portion of our food industry. European honeybees do have a well-developed social structure. Um, a lot of us have heard about this social structure where there are workers who are um, non-reproductive females who will do the basic menial tasks within a hive. There is the queen who is the only reproductive female and she will be creating all of the eggs for the hive and drones who are males whose sole purpose is to mate with the queen and then die. So they don't have a big role other than that one, unfortunately. Um, bees are considered very efficient pollinators. And like we just showed you earlier, they have a lot of ways to help communicate to their sisters that they found food and to how to process that food. However, one thing that I will point out is that bees primarily function during the warmer season, at least honeybees do. Um, you'll see them now, obviously they are active. They've been active for a week or two now, but they will primarily function when it is warmer out and when it, the sun is shining. They are diurnal pollinators. So that does limit the time that they can be active and it can produce its own challenge because farmers need to make sure they monitor when they apply a insecticide because they don't wanna accidentally impact the bee populations. And that can make things a little bit challenging if they're located close to active bees. Here, this image kind of shows you the different members of the caste system with bees. So in A, the one labeled as A, that is a male drone. And you can see he's definitely shaped a little bit differently than the females that are pictured here as well. B is our queen, and she has the larger abdomen to house all of the organs that are going to be responsible for producing eggs and mating and all that stuff. And then at the bottom, we have C, our worker bee. And obviously she has the much smaller abdomen. One thing that's not displayed here is that the workers are equipped with a venomous stinger. They can sting. However, for honeybees, once they sting, they are a one and done. They will sting you and the process of that will tear the stinger out of their bodies resulting in their death. That may not necessarily be true for all bee species though. So this is a great example of some of the things we see with honeybees. Um, our introduced European honeybees have been here long enough that many of them have gone wild out in nature. And sometimes um, they will interface with humans through that. Sometimes you'll get them on your property. I've had people asking, do I spray for these? Um, I can definitely tell you, you do not want to spray for wild honeybees. Um, they can be integrated into a beekeeper's group of bees very, very easily. So just call a beekeeper. Um, extension educators are happy to connect them to you. So wild hives will occur throughout different areas. And um, the best thing to do about them is to simply contact your local beekeeping organization, which, like I said, extension educators can help you do. You may also want to, if you have to deal with a wild hive, check on local ordinances. Many of them will not only require you to not have hives, but may require you to be responsible for their removal as well. And for those of you who are considering beekeeping, that local ordinance will also be applied to any beekeeping operations you do. So before you get started as a beekeeper, or before you take on these tasks, check your local laws. Your extension educator can help you figure out what those are. I could safely say I live in Terre Haute and our ordinances do allow for beekeeping in my city. All right, so let's dive into our native bees. We have a few of these. Uh, some of them you'll love, some of them you won't. Um, I will try to make sure I illustrate them as best I can as we go forward, starting with our mason bee. Oh, I, there's some stuff I should have said first. So one thing about all of our native bees our native bees are great pollinators. However, not all of them will pollinate with the same efficiency or the same desired targets. Uh, honey bees, however, will typically find a forage and they'll pollinate, say, a bunch of clover because they know it's a successful forage. Whereas different bees, like the mason bee I'm about to talk to, may not necessarily choose to stick to one plant. With our native bees, some of them do have social structures developed. Some of them may have queens and colonies, whereas other ones may choose to be solitary. Most of our native bees are capable of stinging. However, most of them won't bother. 
um, you really have to mess with a mason bee or a bumblebee to get it to sting you. They can do it, but generally they just don't care. Um, they will just prefer not to be messed with at all. So let's get started with our mason bee here. You can tell from the image right here that this one looks a little bit different from a honeybee. There are no pollen baskets on its legs and it's covered in a lot more hair, which kind of sets it apart from our honeybee and it's a little bit darker in color. Now, mason bees are one of our solitary bees. They are gonna be active from, from mid-April into June. So they're gonna be cooler weather pollinators. Now in Indiana, that's gonna be helpful because a lot of our orchards are gonna start blossoming around those times. And mason bees can be a huge help to pollinating in orchards. However, they do have one problem because since they don't discriminate, they can be really good at pollinating. Like so I've seen some studies that say that they actually visit more flowers per minute than a honeybee does, but they can cross pollinate. So that means that they, you may not get as much um, single pollination as you would like. They will go to different plants and carry that pollen between them. Um, Susie, I see you're asking, are mason bees the ones that hover near the ground in areas that mostly don't have vegetation? Uh, no, they are going to be around vegetation for the most part. Ones that are hovering close to the ground, I would probably want to see a picture of one just to be sure on that one. So if you happen to find one um, and you're curious about it, send me a picture of it and I can tell you which one it is. Okay, so going into our bumblebees here. I love bumblebees. I think they're kind of adorable amongst insects and they too are great pollinators. So bumblebees can be highly social. They will form colonies with casts. Um, however, they are not as permanent. Most members of the colony will only live for the season in which they're active. And then the queen will be the only one that'll actually overwinter. Um, they like to be, oops, sorry. For some reason it's going on automatic now. Um, they like to be operating during cooler weather uh, and, but they can operate into warmer weather as well. And the great thing about bumblebees is that they will pollinate on a cloudy day. If you guys remember about honeybees, they prefer the sun to be out. Whereas a bumblebee, they will still operate when it's cloudy. So that's great. Bumblebees for the most part are harmless while foraging. So you don't have to worry about them just going and stinging your children or you while you're outside. However, if you get close to their underground nest, they will defend it. Um, now, me personally, I haven't heard of many instances of this myself, so I don't think it's a major concern. I would just kind of keep an eye out. If you happen to see a bunch of bumblebees in an area, you may want to avoid that. All right, so I promised I was going to talk about at least one bee that you guys were not going to love. And unfortunately, that is our carpenter bee. Carpenter bees are a part of our group of Hymenoptera, and they are pollinators. However, we kind of hate them because they typically damage our structures. Now, these guys are our one exception to the rule. These do not sting. They are a bee, but they are incapable of stinging. However, they will carve out holes into structures. Now, what they're doing, the reason they're doing that is they don't want the wood. They don't want to eat the wood. They're creating a nest for themselves because normally they just do it in trees. And since we make our homes and sheds out of wood, they go for that as well. They are solitary. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna carve out that hole. They're going to lay a single egg and then they're gonna stock that hole with um, food for the larva that's going to come out of that. They will act aggressive if you get near their hole. So you may see one just flying at you, trying to scare you away, but keep in mind, they're actually harmless. They can't do anything. They're just trying to threaten you. Now, I know someone's going to have a story where they're going to say, but wait, I've been stung by a carpenter bee. Keep in mind, bees may not necessarily discriminate when they find nesting locations. So it could be that there could be an actual stinging capable species that found an empty hole and is now taking advantage of it. It may not necessarily be a carpenter bee. Um, like I said, carpenter bees pollinate. They actually do help us out, but unfortunately it just kind of puts us at loggerheads because we want the benefit of a pollinator, but we don't want to deal with a carpenter bee who is damaging our property. So I want to go back a slide here for a second. Let's go over what this looks like here. 
So we've seen pictures of several other kinds of bees. This one probably most closely resembles a bumblebee, at least in terms of size. But look at how smooth its body is. It has that kind of black patch right on its thorax. Its abdomen, for the most part, doesn't look like it has much in the way of hair. So it's not really hairy like our other species. It's going to be much more black than our other species. Uh, it's going to be a bit, little bit larger than mason bees and other insects. Um, however, I just want to stress again, it is incapable of stinging. It's just doing damage to our property, unfortunately. Okay, so the thing that I want you guys to consider, and the reason I love doing these programs, because I'm hoping it inspires you to help protect our native species, is how do we preserve our bees? Many of you on here have asked me questions about this before, and I've given you some advice on it. But what I want to do is I want to lay out some thoughts for you to consider. All right, so the first one, which is actually kind of leads into the last one, I kind of misordered these, but I'll work it out, is that diversity is key. Nature does not function in a monoculture very well. So if you plant a bunch of the same thing, you are reducing the diversity in your environment you're making that environment less resilient to change, and you're probably lowering the number of species that you're going to see. Planting diverse numbers of plants, diverse species, groups, etc., is going to improve the presence of different pollinators, and it's going to help provide them safe harbor. Another thing to consider, and this is one of the things that has a major impact on our bee populations, is the responsible and considered use or not using of pesticides. Now, folks, we live in Indiana. We are a farm state. Pesticides, unfortunately, are going to have to be used in order for us to grow our food. There just aren't a whole lot of thing, ways around that. But as long as we educate ourselves and use our pesticides responsibly and also understand when we don't need to use them, that is going to help us preserve our bees. Um, I know a lot of you on here are people who work in removing invasive species who use pesticides. Some of you on here are probably farmers or related to farmers. And some of you on here may just dislike the use of pesticides altogether. And that's okay. We all have to do our jobs and we all wanna make sure that we protect our land and our environment as best we can. So please, when it comes to the use of pesticides, I want you to educate yourselves. Send me questions. It is l quite literally my job to educate people on pesticides. I want to make sure that you guys are armed with all the knowledge you need. The other thing that we can do for our bees, and this is more for our beekeepers, and they already work very hard at this, is to understand and manage diseases, parasites, and predators of our bee species. Um, for the most part, our bees and wasps and ants um, deal a lot with disease and parasites. Um, there is a mite that will attack honeybees that's fairly well known, the varroa mite. There's also a few other insect species that will actually attack wasps. And of course, beekeepers are very well acquainted with a lot of the diseases like foul brood and other things that are going to hit hives. And this is work that they are already doing, but if anyone on here is not a beekeeper, um, I encourage you to please, um, let's, let's educate ourselves so that way we understand what they do. And I am happy to help you figure this out and help you understand. And of course, the last thing I wanted to point out on here is ask yourself, what are you planting? If you want pollinators to come to your yard, you need to plant things that are going to make pollinators want to come to your yard. Um, and this goes very much for bees. I, so in my case, what I do is I want to see honeybees visit my property. I love honeybees. So I allow clover to develop in my yard. I've got a nice white clover going. Um, I wish it were the native species. I'm pretty sure it isn't, but it is providing forage for pollinators. I also, in my yard, develop spiderwort, sunflowers, and several other flowering plants, um, sage, lavender, etc., that are gonna make great forage for pollinators. And that's gonna give them that food to help preserve our native bees uh, very specifically. So what I would do is if you're wanting to plant for them, let's do some research together. Send me an email, ask me a question, and I will ha happily help you plan out or get you in contact with people who can help you plan out what you wanna to do to get pollinators and bees to come to your property. All right, so that is what I had for you this evening. I've got my contact information up in front of you right now. 
Um, I want to encourage you guys to go to our Purdue Ed store at the website here listed. It's got a lot of publications that can be a major help to you when you're trying to solve problems or just learn about different plants and animals. I've also got the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab here who will help you diagnose the really hard problems. Um, and that is one where if you and I can't work together to figure out a problem, then we're gonna send it to these guys. They are the wizards at figuring it, all of this out. All right, so I have got our...